what we're going to be talking about today mostly is AlphaGo. So we're going to have a refresher on monocular tree search, and then we're going to go ahead and talk about AlphaGo and the sort of suite of AlphaGo uh, programs, uh, both today and then on Wednesday as well. Sorry, let me turn on chat one moment. All right. So here's a refresher, right? So basically what's happening is we've got some sort of a policy. I'm gonna call it pi sub rollout here. And we have some state and we're trying to decide an action for that state. And we'd like to get an action for that state that's better than just blindly following whatever pi sub policy says to do. So if we think about, let's just think about a game for a moment. If we think about a game uh, and we had some particular state of the game right now and we're a deterministic type game, then we could go ahead and look ahead all the way down until we get to sort of the leaves of the game, all right? Conceptually, we can do that. We can do that for something like tic-tac-toe. And then we can just basically look through this tree. We know exactly what each node is worth and we can figure out what's the appropriate uh, choice to make, not only for this step, but then after our opponent moves for next steps as well, okay? However, that's not practical for many games, okay? Because the state space is just too large. And so instead, what we wanna do is somehow focus our search of this conceptual tree, uh, this conceptual complete um, uh, tree from where the current state is and what the possible actions are, okay? And you can imagine that's fairly simple in some ways. So for instance, um, if one of your possible moves here has you lose immediately, um, we certainly don't need, well, so if we lose immediately, that's a leaf node and we're not gonna uh, go on any farther. Uh, let me try a different example. Let's say we have a part of the tree where we do poorly most of the time and another part of the tree where we do well most of the time, we'd be better off focusing on that well most of the time. So maybe another way that we can look at this is what we're trying to do is estimate values right, for these particular states or state actions. But, and, and the way we're gonna do that is in a Monte Carlo method, right? So we are going to randomly uh, try particular episodes and then get an average value. And once we get this average value, then we're gonna be able to compare and see which uh, of the actions gives us a higher average value and choose that. And so in our Monte Carlo tree simulation, what we do is we will you know, choose whatever our current state is. So this is the root and select and expand, simulate and back up. So in this case, what this select is gonna do is we're gonna go ahead and select this node and then expand it to create a child. So let's say make that be blue. So that's some random action, which is our child. And then we're gonna simulate it according to our rollout. So we'll go ahead and act according to our policy and we'll get then to some terminal state and we'll have then some final reward. And then in the backup, we'll back that up the tree to each of those. And we'll do this over and over again, okay? And the idea for this is uh, we do one rollout for each loop iteration. So, so one rollout, basically one select, one expand, one simulate, which is a rollout, uh, and then one backup. Okay. So as we're going, we are expanding our tree. Every time we're expanding our tree, we're backing up our values up through not just that expanded node, but all the way to the root. And so we're seeing the results of simulations 
in, a, in a, multiple simulations in a given node. The root is going to see the result of all of the simulations. If we look at a particular node, it's going to see the result of all the simulations from that node and below it. Okay. And that means we're going to tend to get a average of what the true Q value is. And once we have that, av that, that average, we can then go ahead and choose the root child with the highest either average or number. Number is this funny um, simplification to avoid possible outliers. Okay. The theory that if we've been simulating a particular node, a lot of particular child, that must be because it's been more promising than other children. Questions on, on this overall, I'm gonna go through each of the select, expand, simulate, and backup with some pseudocode on each one. Okay, so let's look at, uh, oh, and first off, of course, each node, we're gonna store the number of times uh, that we have gone to that node and the total reward, so Q over N. is our average value for V. Okay. And so the selection is fairly straightforward. We basically, now this is a key, and this is a problem many people got run in the midterm, so, so be aware of this. So we are starting at the root, and then we are always in the selection phase, then going to a child of the root, and then a child of that, and a child of that, and a child of that, and so on until we hit what's called a leaf, okay? So here, this is what we call a leaf. That is, it's either terminal, there are no children, or it has an unexpanded child. So some child we've never visited. And if that's the case, then we're done. Otherwise, we go through and pick the child with the highest um, um, upper confidence for tree uh, value. So we're gonna be calculating the UCT of this guy and the UCT of this guy and the UCT of this guy. And we don't calculate the UCT of, of this guy. Uh, Garrett, why don't we calculate the UCT of that one? Uh, because it is a leaf. So and so, yeah, so it's either. Uh, what are two things that can make it a leaf? Uh, if it has unexpanded children. Yep. So if there, there's stuff we haven't already simulated for it. Yep, that's one possibility. Or if it's a terminal state. Or if it's a terminal uh, state. So yep. the game's already over, so there's nothing The game's to already it. over, exactly. Does that make sense? So, so when we are comparing the UCT, we don't say, hey, we've got this entire tree so far, right, that we, uh, have, have done, let's say here. And so we're going to go ahead. This is, is not what we're doing. So we're not saying, well, these are all leaves. Let me go ahead and calculate the UCT of all these and pick the best one. No, what we're saying is, what's the best first action to take? Okay, according to what we know so far, right? According to our exploitation, that is our average value, and also taking into account our exploration bonus, okay? So greedily, given both these things, what is the best child to take from the root? And then from there, what's the best child to take from there? What's the best child to take from there? What's the best child to take from there? Until we get to this termination state, which is a leaf. Any questions on that? Okay, then what do we do? Then we expand. Well, if we're a terminal mode, a terminal node, we don't need to expand, right? We just leave it alone. Otherwise, we create a random child node that is a random, this is a random action. And I should suppose really a random unexpanded action, right? Not an action we've already got to. So we take, we take a, an action we've never tried before set its Q value and its N to zero, and then go ahead and return that child. So that is the new expanded child. So the expanded child is either a no-op, if we're at a terminal node, or it is 
a randomly new, new child. Okay. And then we simulate. So we're at this V, right? This is our expanded node. And we start just simulating actions in our game, okay? We simulate them according to whatever our rollout policy is. Uh, and our goal is to try and come up with some choice that is better than that rollout policy, right? Our, our choice for how to actually take an action in the root node. And so this rollout policy could be very bad, like let's say a random policy, uh, or it could be fairly good, but our, the effect is gonna be that the Monte Carlo tree search should end up with an even better action than the rollout would have chosen by itself. So we keep going until we get to a terminal state, and then we go ahead and get our reward for that terminal state. For the moment, I'm gonna assume we're playing games and we have zero for rewards all the way until we get to a leaf. So it's only at leafs we have a reward and we have you know, a plus one or minus one. Okay. Questions on that simulation? So one rollout, that's what we're doing. That's not to say we couldn't do lots of other rollouts that will affect this node from children doing rollouts or grandchildren or so on. And then we do our backup. So starting at whatever our, this is again our expanded node. We take our reward and we add that reward to the total reward for all of our ancestors and also add our count or increment the count. And, the, and as Jacob said, yeah, the rollout can be random or it cannot be random. It could be a fairly good policy. And in fact, we're gonna see uh, as we look at Go uh, here a bit later that it's using a much better than random policy for its rollout policy. But what we do end up with is in expectation, the Monte Carlo tree search of the root node is better than or equal to high rollout of the root node. Uh, I guess I'll say so the value of this and the value of this, right? So the Monte Carlo tree search, the action that it chooses should end up with a higher value or at least not lower value than the action that the rollout policy would have chosen. So it's for this reason that we look at this as a policy improver, but it's not a uh, general policy improver that improves the whole policy. It is a policy the improver that strictly improves a single action for a single state. That is, you've got a particular state, you wanna know what action to use, use a Monte Carlo tree search and it'll tell you the better action for that state. Okay. But if you then go ahead and choose that action in your real environment, then you can go ahead and use Monte Carlo tree search for your next action and so on. So you do end up with a overall a better policy for the trajectory that you're on. Any questions about the Monte Carlo tree search? So it's kind of at the heart of the AlphaGo family. All right. Uh, so DeepMind's AlphaGo. So let's look first at a little history. AlphaGo in 2015 um, came out and this, you know, basically beat professional players. So, right, human experts, and this was uh, quite surprising. AlphaGo was designed using a neural network, okay? So it, it has two neural networks, one to learn a value function and one to learn a policy function. Okay, so basically one learns uh, uh, you know, one learns a, a policy P and one learns a value function. So the policy P 
again, is the probability of taking action A. Uh, in state S, and the value function is the expected, the, the uh, value of state S, assuming you're following your policy. Um, there, as you'll see, we're, we're looking at four different DeepMind programs, and they get over time simpler and simpler and simpler. So this example is fairly complex, and it, uh, they basically learn we don't need all that complexity. Okay? So the first thing they did was it was trained on human plays. So these neural networks were initially trained based on a uh, corpus of, I don't remember how big it is, I think it's millions of uh, games of human experts. There's some website it comes from. And also handcrafted features. Okay, so it's not that it just got the Go board. It got the Go board uh, uh, summarized in a lot of different ways that people have thought would be very useful in order to figure out how to play. So this policy function was trained on a large part of human plays. Uh, let's look at this in a moment, see what happens. Then AlphaGo Zero was two years later. Okay, so AlphaGo Zero, they said, what, so the zero of AlphaGo Zero, um, Jake, do you know what the zero is? Uh, I'm assuming it's zero refers to like not having access to the prior knowledge. Exactly, this is basically zero Zero human um, yeah I've done what is knowledge the right information let's see it's zero human um, let's just say kind of preconception something like that all self play so no human games no human crafting of what seem like useful features. Let me back up a second. Let me just give a, right, a brief introduction to Go. Right? Go is played on this 19 by 19 board. And black and white alternate, and each one places a stone on a particular spot. So a play is very, a very simple. Play a stone on an unoccupied spot. Uh, and then if, you're, if you have, let's say, a you're solid and your opponent is not solid and you surround their stone or a set of stones, then you get to pick up their stone. And the goal is to try and occupy as much space as possible. Okay. AlphaGo Zero, so had no prior knowledge, all self-play. Instead of having two neural networks, they just had a single neural network okay, that, that would calculate both a value and a policy. Um, and it had kind of this neural network so far that it'd keep track of that would be the champion. And then it would train new neural nets. And as a new neural net could beat the old, the old neural net, the current reigning champion by 55% or better, then now they were crowned a new champion. Okay? And that just kept going. And the self-play got better and better and better and never actually really plateaued. Um, Garrett asks, are the handcraft features the only input of the industry to the board state? Um, I think, I may have a slide on this. I think they got the, they certainly, if not explicitly got the entire board state, they implicitly got the entire board state. Okay, so it may not have been just represented as a single, I don't remember, I don't remember but I think they have all that information. AlphaGo Zero just got the board state, okay? So AlphaGo got a bunch of handcrafted features. AlphaGo Zero, as we'll see, just got the board state, okay? So what's the 19 by 19? What are the blacks? What are the whites? Whose turn is it? And for some of the, there are some reasons for Go that you actually need previous, I think it's eight boards. So there are some rules in Go about repetition uh, that you can't repeat board configurations, and so therefore you need that previous state in order to determine that. 
and I'm not a big Go player, so I don't. Uh, that that's the extent to which I know about it. So alpha zero removed the word, so no more go. Why no more go? Uh, mark. So why alpha zero, why not alpha go zero? Uh, because it wasn't about go anymore. Yeah, it's not just go. Right, we basically add in chess and we add in uh, what's sometimes called Japanese chess or shogi, uh, which is like chess, except when you capture, similar to chess, uh, but when you capture an opponent's piece, you get to take their piece and make it your own. So it's like you have, uh, I don't know, conquered a uh, samurai and now put them on your team. Okay. So no handcrafted features either. Uh, the input is still the same. Basically, we're getting the chess board or the shogi board. There's still some extra information that has to be provided. Like for chess, uh, have we castled? Has black castled already? Because you're only allowed one castle in a uh, game. And so therefore, we have to keep track of that information. Um, or I guess actually is a, is a castle legal, maybe even not even, because if you've moved the pieces that be involved in the castle, you're not allowed to do it. Um, the neural network itself was identical between all these games except for the input and the output. So what the exact configuration of the input to the network looked like and what the output looked like was, was different. We'll, we'll see why for the policies. Basically, because the actions are different, right? For Go, your actions are where do you want to place a piece? Uh, for chess, it's a little more complicated. You know, what location do you want to move from? What location do you want to move to? And then sometimes a lot of extra information. Like if you're moving a pawn to the queen, to the, to the eighth rank, do you want it to turn into a queen or a knight or a you know, bishop? All those things are part of an action. And yes, RL was used to optimize the neural network. So that's the other thing he said. These also use Monte Carlo tree search along with reinforcement learning to update the uh, neural net. And how does current best versus latest impact the reinforcement learning? Are you talking about that champion? Uh, for Alpha Zero, you said that it uses not, no current best neural net, just always uses the latest, whereas the last one only updated if it won 55% of the oh, games. Oh, yeah. yeah. This is just partly, uh, it's a simplification, right? It's, it shows this progression from complicated to less complicated to less complicated. Right? It's more complicated to say, okay, we're gonna have a current champion, we're gonna try and keep, train the neural network, and only if the neural network uh, beats the last neural network by enough of a margin are we gonna now make that the new neural network. And here we just say, we got a neural network, we train it, we use it. So it's simpler, but it still works. Um, and even the hyperparameters for training the neural network are the same, the hyperparameters for Everything are the same, except there is one hyperparameter that we'll see in a bit that's, that's scaled based on how many actions there are. So it's an exploration hyperparameter, and we need to tune it based on how many possible actions that we want to be exploring. And then finally, last year, we get to mu zero. So alpha zero knows the rules of the game. So the rules of chess, shogi, and mu zero are part of the Monte Carlo tree search. So when you're at a state and you say, hmm, okay, let me consider moving this knight. Well, or let me consider this action, okay, which you and I would call moving a knight. The resulting state will be the same it was before except there was a knight here and now there's a knight here. And actually there was a bishop under this new knight's position and now it's gone. Okay? So that's part of the rules of chess. Another part of the rule of chess is if you were doing a rollout, how do you know you're in a terminal state? Well, you know you're in a terminal state when one of the uh, um, um, pieces is in checkmate or we have a draw of some sort. You know, maybe there's more than you know, 50 plays. And so the... Um, the uh, alpha zero says we don't know any of that stuff. Okay, I'm sorry, not alpha zero. 
mu zero says we don't know any of the rules of the game. So during the Monte Carlo tree search, we somehow need to learn how the game works. That is, as you move, as you choose an action from a state, what the heck is going to be happening in the future? Okay, what sorts of um, rewards you're going to get, for instance? So this is very similar to what Dr. Talvati was talking about last Wednesday. That doesn't work very well, but it actually works pretty well in U0. Varun has a question: Is the RL then using gradient descent, or is this a brand new way to optimize the neural network? So this is this Monte Carlo tree search. Um, it's basically um, so Monte Carlo tree search gives us this mechanism for coming up with a reward, uh, and then we do use standard neural network techniques in order to actually optimize the neural network. So we have a loss function. We'll look we'll look into that in a, in a, in a little more detail. Okay, so bring that question back up if you still have it as, as we're talking about that. And the nice thing about this is, so for something like Go or Shogi or, or Chess, it seems like an odd constraint to say you don't get to know the rules, okay? Because a couple of reasons. The rules are pretty simple. Everyone who plays knows them. Um, but this same uh, networks and same approach can be used to play not only those board games, but also play something like Atari games, okay? Where there, it's much less clear, right? When you are playing to begin with, you certainly don't know what the rules are of this game, right? You don't know uh, if you're first playing Space Invaders that when you press the fire button, um, that this bullet will go up and if it hits something, it'll explode it. Now we kind of have guesses that that's true, but you, you just don't know what will happen. In some games, you know, you, um, let's say, shoot a opponent, and then that might split into five different new opponents, right? So that might be a bad thing. Red opponents would be bad things to, to um, fire on, perhaps. So you don't really know what the dy dynamics are, and you have to learn some sort of a model of those dynamics in your head, and that's the same thing that Mu0 is doing. Okay, so we'll go over all those. Basically, today, we're going to be talking about AlphaGo and AlphaGo0, and then on Wednesday, we'll talk about Alpha0 and Mu0. Questions so far? Okay. So this is all, so we have at the top left is we're describing which one of these we're talking about. Okay, some of this stuff is shared and some is not, but I just wanna make clear for the, for the while, for the, for the moment, we're gonna be just talking about Alpha0. So Alpha0, we have these different uh, policy networks. So this policy network is, so this is SL, and SL is from supervised learning. Okay, so we feed in a bunch of, basically we'll feed in a bunch of state, uh, states, and so let's see, we'll feed in a state as the input. And then we'll have an action probability distribution. Actually, sorry, that's not quite true. Our target, that is the um, known good is going to be the chosen action. So this is going to be so, some sort of a encoding where we've all possible actions and we'll have zeros for most of them and we'll have one for the action that was chosen. So a human in this state played this action and that will be one training pair that we're going to feed into our neural network. The way you train neural networks is you feed in inputs and desired outputs, and then it will compare its desired output against its actual output, tweak the parameters to make the uh, output be closer to that desired output. Okay. So standard supervised learning. 
with human games, the input is actually not just this clean board representation. It actually is handcrafted features. We'll talk about it in a moment. Um, and just to let you know, not this is not training, but this is just in order to actually feed in some input to the neural network and get the output, which is this probability distribution over actions, uh, it takes about three milliseconds. Okay? And that's going to become important and explains why we have this other policy called a rollout policy. So the reinforcement learning policy is trained with reinforcement learning. Okay, and then uh, let me make that more clear. So this is trained in the standard neural net fashion. Okay, the difference is where do we get our inputs and targets? In supervised learning, this came from human chess games. In the reinforcement learning case, this is going to come from self-play. So we're going to do self-play. That's going to give us a, a sequence of states in the game. And it's also going to a sequence of actions that were taken. And we are going to train our, neural, our, our, our RL neural network to uh, learn to play the way we played in the game. Now you may say that's a little weird because we're doing this self-play, right? And in this self-play, how are we choosing what to play? Uh, Shannon, do you have a guess? Using one of the neural networks? We're gonna be using this neural network and what else? What technique that we've used, looked at that will improve a policy? The, like using Monte Carlo tree search with the role Exactly. Policy. So our self play is gonna use our RL neural network plus Monte Carlo tree search. So at every action that we take is gonna be better than the RL network would have chosen by itself. It's better, and so we train the, the RL network, hey, this is better than you had, right? I have this board state, you were gonna choose this, I have some better choice to make. And so that's what we're gonna be training the reinforcement learning with. So it's, it's this interesting bootstrapping where to begin with, RL is gonna make random choices, and Monte Carlo Tree Search is going to optimize those random ones somewhat, so they'll be slightly better than random. And then we retrain the RL network and say, hey, go make it more like the slightly random than the totally random, right? So better than random, rather than random. And then we just go back and forth with that. So every time through this Monte Carlo tree search loop, we are getting better choices than the RL network currently is predicting or suggesting. And so then we say, learn to do that. Does that, so let me see if I can, So basically what we've got is the RL network. Okay. It comes up with an action for state S. We feed that into Mark Carlo tree search and it comes up with a better action. All right, so what comes in is state S. A better action for state S. And then we create a training example. The input is S and the target is the better action for S. Okay, so the reinforcement learning network is coming up with, and it's actually coming up with not just an action, it actually comes up with a probability distribution but it'll certainly come up with an action. We'll feed in the monocolor tree search. We come up with a better action. And now we say, okay, this is a good thing to learn. Now over time, 
these are not going to be good training examples anymore, right? Let's say that, uh, let me give you an example. Let's say you're just learning to play chess, right? And so this is the first 20 minutes you've been playing. And so you choose some moves that are not very good, okay? And let's say you're training a neural network for that. Well, a year from now, you're a better player and the choices you would make would be different. So this neural network, we're gonna be changing what the training examples are over time. Okay? So right now, this is the best we can say to do for us. But in the future, we may have better choices and we may remove these training examples from our, in fact, we will remove these training examples from our data set. So we're gonna keep our data set to be the last, I don't know, half million um, uh, games we played. I'm making that number up, it's on that order. So the half million episodes we have, those will be good training examples. Anything over than half a million, those were old versions. Uh, information we had learned from monocolor tree search on old versions of the neural net. Better to just throw that away. Because as we do monocolor tree search with a new neural net that we have, the current neural net, we'll get better new choices. Questions on that? All right. So that's why this training is reinforcement learning with self-play. So, you know, I include this one call a tree search. We have the same inputs, which makes sense. It's the same network. Um, and it also takes three milliseconds, which makes sense because it's the same network. Do we have guarantees at convergence? We don't. Uh, let me back up a second. I guess if we had Well, no, we don't have guarantees of convergence of neural nets in general. So now that we have a neural network in here, we, we don't have any guarantees. Okay. Um, the rollout policy is a quicker policy. That's the reason we have it. So instead of milliseconds, it's microseconds. So it's three orders of magnitude faster. And the idea is it is a different network much, much shallower. In fact, it's just linear based on some low level handcrafted features. So we basically quickly throw together features. We feed it into this fast linear um, network and we come back with a better than random policy, which is our rollout policy. So this one is trained on human games just as the SL is trained on human games. So the idea is that's what we're gonna use as our rollout policy. We can't afford to use RL for a rollout policy because it's too expensive. And we will see when we get to alpha zero, they're gonna get rid of this rollout policy. In fact, they're done. We're gonna come up with a way where we don't have to do rollout at all. Okay. So the handcrafted features, let's look at an example for the supervised learning or reinforcement learning networks. Uh, an example would be like, if you were to play at this 19 by 19 location, how many stones would you capture immediately? Right? It's useful information. Um, I, I'm gonna just say we have the white, well, we have the, 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 the board plus all of these. Um, different features. So how many opponent stones would there be? If you moved here, would this be a successful ladder capture? And I looked up ladder capture in um, Wikipedia, and it's basically, if you move and then I move and then you move and then I move and then you move and I move all the way up the board, basically some, at some place you're gonna hit something. And depending on what that is, either black or white is gonna come out better on this ladder. So it kind of pre-calculates that for you. And then there are a number of other such features. The rollout features basically have, for every place you can play, so for every location on the board, they look at a three by three pattern around the board and, um, and encode that. So basically they're saying, is it one of these three by three patterns? So you know immediately 
what your three by three pattern is that is around you on the board. And that allows you then to easily provide a linear model that will say basically, if I have this pattern, apply this weeding. Okay. So it is a large pre-computation of, it's not that large really of features because basically all of them are gonna be zero except whatever the particular pattern is. Uh, you can, there's markings like if you move here, does this save you from capture? Some other ideas like that. The value network, so let's go back and look at, what is the SL network output? Uh, Nick, right, so the SL network is telling us the policy, this is the policy. So the input is the state which is the board plus features, what does the output look like? Like what shape is it? Um, it's a probability distribution. It's a probability distribution, exactly. Uh, over, over all the actions that you can how make many actions in that are state. There? Let's, uh, let's, say that, let's, let's, let's say that all the actions are the same for all the states. All the actions are the same for I mean, all the states. Yeah, what is an action in Go? to place a uh, stone in a specific location. How many locations are there? Uh, 19 by 19. 19 by 19. So it's a probability distribution over 19 by 19 uh, board locations plus one for a pass. Um, if you pass, are you out of the game? I don't think completely? so. Okay. I, I, again, I'm not a, I've played Go like three times in my life. So I think you're allowed to pass. Uh, and the other person continues. So it's not like a resignation. Um, so that's what it is. Basically, it is 19 by 19 plus one numbers uh, that are probabilities, right? That's sum to one. Uh, you don't know, need to know which piece you're playing because you're not moving pieces. Here's the key, Jake. So for Go, you have a basket of stones or a bowl of stones, and you pick one up, place it on the board. That's your, that is your action. So it's not like chess where you're picking a piece from the board and then moving into a different piece. We're not moving, all we're doing is placing, okay? And Varun has some expert go knowledge and says that the game is over if both people pass consecutively. Thank you. So in general in go, uh, apparently there aren't draws. There's wins or losses. Um, Part of it has to do with the fact they think that the white player goes second and has a disadvantage and so gets like a half bonus. And so therefore, if it ends up with a draw, I think it's that white really wins. But all I really know about the go is according to official rules, you can't draw. Okay, okay and so that is the output of the SL network and the RL network, because the SL network is just like the RL network, right? The only difference is the RL network starts with SL's weights and then makes them better. Um, Sean, what's the output of the SL network? Um, I'm not sure, I'm gonna say just be like the, the values. <laughs> okay, so you say values plural. Tell me what you mean. Um, I guess like the, uh, I guess for each move it might return like the, a score of how good that move is. Let me help you this. This is the state value network. So uh, the value measuring like how, how desirable a certain state is. Yep. Here I give you a go board and I say to you in your analysis, how, how good is it? How good is it looking for black? And so how might, you, how might you provide that information? Um, you'd run it through the whole... Uh, no, 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 I mean, what, not how do you calculate it, but what would the output be? How, in what form 
would you provide that information? A number, multiple numbers? Probably a single number. Okay, so it's a single number. And what does it represent? Well, you just said the what's how its range? beneficial it is. So what's its range? Um, probably negative one to one. Okay, could be negative one to one. Uh, so if I say uh, zero, what does that mean? If it uh, outputs? It, it, that, would, that would be neutral. So it doesn't okay. So gain. zero would be like sort of a, it's anybody's game. Right. right? And a negative one would be like instant loss, where a one would be an instant. How about a negative point seven? Um, not a great move. <laughs> this isn't a move. This is a state. Oh, sorry. Not 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 a great state to be in. For yeah. So this is not good for. Uh, uh, I think actually the input also includes which the current player is, right? So okay. it's it's not good for the current players. And 0.7, you know, it is good for the current player. Right. So negative one to one, that works. We could also use just zero to one. So what's the probability of the current player winning is a way we could interpret that. Uh -huh. so. All right. Does that make sense? Yeah. Okay. So here's what we're going to do. We are going to initialize the neural network. Now let's just think about this. So this is... Before this, we have uh, train SL and the rollout policy with supervised learning. Right, that is human games. So that's the initialization that you see And then we initialize RL weights from SL. Yep. So that's our, our, our starting point. So we start out with a trained network that is, I'm trying to remember the numbers. I think the SL network has an accuracy of about like 60% and the rollout policy has an accuracy of maybe 30%. So compared to how humans are doing. So it's not like a clone of a human player at all. Okay. It often does what a expert human player will do, but many times doesn't. Um, and so what we do is we self play a game. Okay. So we self play a game that is using Monte Carlo tree search for every move. When, so this P is going to be our RL policy network. Okay. And when we take do Monte Carlo tree search on it, it comes up with a better move. So pi is going to be kind of the policy that you get by taking the rollout policy, applying Monte Carlo tree search. Sorry. The policy you get by taking the, the combination of the RL policy and the rollout policy. I'm going to explain why in a moment. Basically, um, the Monte Carlo tree search that AlphaGo uses is somewhat different from Monte Carlo tree search that we've been using. So it actually has true po two policies, one policy that's used inside the tree and another policy that's used for rollouts. But in any case, that part doesn't matter. Just what we've got is a better policy than we started with. So pi of s tells us, basically, this is a state in the game This is the chosen action based on Monte Carlo tree search. So we know the input is the state, and we know the output, which is the chosen action. So that pair is going to allow us to train the RL neural network. Questions on that? So do, do you get the fact that basically we now have a better policy for the state 
uh, a better target for that RL network than we used to have. It had one distribution for what to do in the state, and now we're saying, here's a better distribution. Make yourself more like that. Okay. And again, Monte Carlo Tree Search is where we got this, this better one. The other thing we need to train though, so we actually have two networks to train. We have the RL network and we have the value network. Both of them we need to train. We haven't yet looked at why we want a value network, right? This is the state value network, but we do. So how do we train that? How do we know whether, so how do we know for this state, whether it's a good state to be in or a bad state to be in? Um, Julius, or maybe, how do we know whether this was a good state in this particular game or a bad state? Um, look at the, the value, the, the like, how do we know if it's, yep. Is there like Q values involved? Nope. Let's say you watch someone play a game. And halfway through the game, you took a picture of the board, okay? And, um, and then you watched the entire game. And then someone comes back and shows you that picture and says, was this a good state to be in for black? Um, I guess you can look at how many, how many like, uh, steps you took to win. Well, what do you care how many? Did you win? Yeah, did you win? You're yeah. A, yeah. If black won, was this a good state for black? Yes. And if black lost, is it a good state for black? Not a good state. No, nope. so that's what we do. We look at this win, loser, draw. Well, I'll get an or draw off now for go. We're gonna add it back in later. So we look at our win, lose result. We basically say, we had this game, okay? And for this game, we had all these states. And if black ended up winning, all these states that black was in were good, and all the states that white was in were bad for white, right, for that player. And so those are all gonna be training examples that we're gonna use. We're gonna basically use and say, okay, here was a state, and we know whether they won or lose, feed that in. Here's another state. So all of the states in the game are gonna have the same result. All, all the ones where black plays, we're gonna say it's good for black. All the ones where white plays, we're gonna say it's bad for white, if black ended up winning. If white ended up winning, we're gonna say the opposite thing. So um, we record these, we record them in, uh, what sort of a data structure, Mazda? Um, so, well, one inclination that I have is that maybe we wanna keep the best things near the top, so a heap might help. Okay, and actually I don't mean data structure. What sort of reinforcement learning uh, thing might we save it in? Um, well, this feels quite similar to like the tree from Monte Carlo Tree Search, but it's um, not that vocabulary. Well, what we're doing is we're saving these information, right? We're recording this information and then later on, we're sampling from those um, that saved information to train our network. Hmm. So we want something that we can sample from. Yep. So it's some sort of a buffer that we can replay from. Right. And what are we replaying? Um, Let's call them experiences. The experiences, okay. So this is an experience replay buffer. We basically play the game, we shove into our experience replay buffer each um, state, action, and whether we won or lost in that game, okay? So we put them all in our experience replay buffer, and then we go ahead and start training our network from that experience replay buffer. Okay. 
So we have half a million games, each of which has some particular set of states, which correspond to the moves that were made through the game. And we just create a mini batch, pull out 2,000 states, not all states in the same game, just random 2,000 states from all these games. Right? We want them to be uncorrelated with one another. And then we train the RL network, we train the value network. And then we go through and have these two parallel things that are happening, right? One parallel, we are playing self-play games and throwing them in the replay buffer. So that's... Here we have our replay buffer. And here we have our self play. And every game we throw in all the states from the game. And then here we have a neural network uh, training. And this pulls out. Uh, random uh, batches and then trains the RL network and trains the value network. Here, old games fall out of the replay buffer, right? Which makes sense because old games, again, were played with old networks, old RL networks and old value networks, and so are no longer accurate necessarily as to what the uh, RL and value should be trained to be. Questions? All right, so how do we use a policy network? Um, I said we don't use it for our rollout policy because it's too slow. It takes milliseconds instead of mic uh, microseconds to run. So instead, we're going to use it in our monocolor tree search to help guide our action selection. Right now, when we, there's a couple things that happen. So when we expand a node in the monocolor tree search we had looked at, we randomly choose a child. Wouldn't it be better to choose a child that our current policy says is better? So rather than, rather than trying all actions randomly, let's try the action that looks most promising from this state. So that is how, that's one thing we're gonna use our tree policy for. So what, when we choose an action, here's what we're gonna do. So this is in our select phase. This is gonna be slightly different from monocolor tree search we're accustomed to. So we're gonna take the action that has the highest Q value and the highest u value, where u is this bonus. So this is our bonus. And it is so it gives a bonus if the tree policy, which is our likes this action. or if we haven't uh, tried this action. Much, right? Think of it as basically, it's proportional to our tree policy with a decay based on how many times we've tried it. So the more we've tried it, the less we count the tree policy. So, so the Q is our Monte Carlo approximation, right? This is, as we have gone and approximated more and more with Monte Carlo, the Q is gonna become more and more accurate. And as we do it more and more, N will get higher and higher, and we will count the policy value less and less. But if we don't know anything about Q, then it's gonna be counting the policy a lot. Concept makes sense? So when we were looking at Monte Carlo tree search before, our UCT bonus was strictly based on how much have we looked at. And we had no prior information 
about what actions are good or bad. Here, we do have this prior information and we're using the prior information. So, um, P of SA is based on the neural network policy. Okay. So that's why we have the policy and that's how the Monte Carlo tree search can sort of effectively use that policy because it's using it to guide ourselves down the tree we've constructed so far. The value network, what the hell is it for? Right, why do we have a value network? The reason we have a value network is so that we get better simulation results. So what's gonna happen? When we expand a node, right, once we've expanded a node, we're gonna do simulation like we did in monocolor tree search that we've seen before. So we're gonna do a rollout, all right? We're gonna do a rollout to estimate values and we'll use the rollout policy for the rollout. So the rollout policy is kind of crappy, but it's quick and it's better than random, okay? So this will help us get a, uh, an approximation, sorry, not an approximation, but a sampling of the result of taking this rollout. And that'll give us one data point for this expanded node. The second thing we do though is we say, you know what? Why don't we go ahead and also use a value network? So we're gonna use the value network as another approximation or estimation of the value. And then we will go ahead and do uh, an interpolation between the two, a weighted sampling or a weighted average between the two. So that is our new value. So we get, we go through selection, we choose a particular node and we now say, okay, we are going to both do a rollout to come up with some uh, terminal result. And we are going to also calculate the value network estimate for this state. And then we combine to get a better result. And that's what we're gonna to use to back up. So we're not gonna just back up the rollout result. We're gonna back up the average of the rollout result and our value estimations, uh, our value networks estimation of the state's value. Uh, does running through the value network take way longer than the rollout? Uh, the key for the value network thing is we only have to do that once per node, right? So, as we are um, going through this network, we have our policy network that we're using. So our sort of P of S comma A, but we cache that basically in every edge along this tree. And then when we get to the end, we have to do just a single uh, value network. So I guess what happened, what really, the question is, does it depend on the, I guess it depends on the length of the game. So it takes a thousand times longer to run through the value network than it takes through the rollout network. So you can probably finish rolling out before you finish the value network, that's true. And as I remember, they do have some, um, I think there is some, uh, optimization that they do as far as sending off the neural network to do its calculation and then when it comes back being able to sort of continue on doing stuff so so I think there may be some asynchron asynchronicity uh, in calculating the value but we have to remind myself from the paper I don't remember right now Okay, so we have this weighted average. This is what we're gonna do. So for our monocolor tree search, we're gonna have N, 
we're going to have, and this is a little confusing. These are the num these are the um, naming conventions that were used in the paper. So the naming convention of the paper is we save N of SA and WSA, and QSA is our calculated mean. So the terminology differs from the book, which um, represents Q as the total rather than as the mean. And then P of SA is our prior probability of selecting that age, and this comes from the tree policy, which is our neural network. So MCTS for AlphaGo, and this is different from the standard MCTS, takes a state, which is called the root, right? That's normal. It takes a tree policy, so that is new, right? Not part of normal MCTS, and then takes a rollout policy, which is normal. It also takes a state value approximator, which is new. So normally, monocolor tree search, you just take a state and you take a rollout policy. Here, we're adding this tree policy and adding the value approximator. So we repeat, as we say, lots of times. Um, and this is, right, n is a hyperparameter. Uh, I believe they used 800 times. And they make a selection. Uh, the expansion is more easily understood if you look at it as part of the select. So I have pseudocode for that on the next page. And then we go ahead and do our evaluation. So our, and Really, conceptually, our, our, our pie sub tree should be part of the selection. I just didn't show it in here. Okay, but really, that's part of the selection. So evaluation takes our expanded node, our rollout policy, and our approximator, and gets our reward, and then backup backs it up. So the selection node, uh, this is the same as normal MCTS, right? If it's a terminal, we just return it. And again, the old expand, if it was terminal, just returned it. So this returns an expanded node. We then take the child with the highest Q plus A. And this is a key difference from regular monocolor tree search. We include unexpanded children. Okay? So we just look at all of the possible child actions. Uh, we do use the rules of the game to only look at legal actions in this case. So we don't try, you know, all, uh, all possible ways to represent an action, but only the ones that are legal in this state. And if the child is expanded, so let's say this is the tree. So that's the tree, okay? We take the highest Q plus A. And we go, let's say, left, okay? And assuming we only had two actions, uh, then the root doesn't have any unexpanded children. We get to here, this guy doesn't have any unexpanded children. But we, let's say, go to the left again, because this is the highest QPSA. Normally, in the old MCTS, we'd stop here. We say, this is a selected node. We have to expand to the right, because we have to expand an unexpanded child. Here we don't. Here we still say uh, Q plus U for here. And we also, for the non-existent child here, we also look at the Q plus U. So we just say, what would the Q plus U be for taking that action? It's easy to calculate the Q value, right? Because that's just uh, uh, zero because we don't have any um, current estimate of it. And the U value is just going to be our tree policy divided by the number of times it's been visited, which is one plus the number of times. So it's gonna really, this is just gonna be simplified to uh, some constant times the tree policy. 
So we do that for all possible actions, including expanded nodes and unexpanded nodes. And then we go through the one that's highest. So it might be we end up choosing this guy. And then we would expand one of its children. Okay. Questions on that? Okay, and then the evaluate um, is going to, sorry, let me back up a second. Uh, expand is as normal. Just create a node, set its uh, W to zero, set its N to zero, set its P to whatever the tree policy is. Here in evaluate, um, We have the, this is basically do a rollout. Do a rollout. Okay, so just as we're accustomed to. And then we, we save the value. And then the second thing we do is create this other approximation. So we call this neural net. And then we return this weighted average. And then backing up to the tree, standard. So that is it in a nutshell. So what we're, we are using MCTS to determine what action to take at every point in the game. We are saving the game and the actions we've taken and the end result in an experience replay buffer. And then in the, exp the experience replay buffer is used to take samples and train the two neural networks. So the rollout policy never gets updated. The rollout policy is fixed uh, based on how it was initially initialized. The value network and the rollout network, uh, the reinforcement learning network, sorry, uh, do get updated as we play and get better and better and better. So this is just conceptually what the select looks like. We have a game state. We go ahead and pick the maximum Q plus U, and that takes us to a new state. Um, and we uh, just keep going until we basically get to an unexpanded node or a terminal node like here. Uh, we see this is proportional to, and there's some constant that decreases over time. So we reduce uh, the exploration bonus. Uh, over, over time, and I don't actually remember whether that time is within simulations within a particular MCTS, or that's across MCTSs throughout the game. Uh, I just don't remember which one it is. Questions, that's the select part. Our sort of expand and evaluate, you can think of as we get down to, this is the expanded node. And we will evaluate its value in two different ways. We'll use the value network. And we'll also roll out using the rollout policy. Okay. And this is the reward. And we do a weighted average of these two. And when we're done, we back it all up. So we have our weighted average. So we have our weighted average here, and then we feed it up and up and up and up. And all it's doing is uh, adding the weighted reward here and adding 110. 
questions at this point? Okay, so the good news is it will get somewhat simpler. Oh, and let me just show you the picture of the self-play. So this is conceptually. So we have our initial state, right? We have an empty board. How do we know what to play in an empty board? Well, we go ahead and use Monte Carlo tree search and that comes up with our action to take. In some sense, that's a, uh, we, we come up with this probability distribution, which is really this um, set of ends at the top level of the root. That is how many times we've tried each action. So that gives us a, kind of an idea of which actions are better than other actions and by how much. And then we sample an action from that probability distribution or really just pick, a, um, uh, pick, the, act, pick the best action. And then now it's S2's turn. We do the same thing. It thinks this is a good action to play. We play it, we continue on. And then finally, we get to the end of the game. We get a result. So this is uh, the final result of the game. Okay. And so our, again, our training is really we train the uh, value network with S1 comma Z pairs, right? So SI comma Z rather. So for every state, we're gonna feed in this same, what was the result of the game? Okay. For the reinforcement learning network, we're gonna feed in uh, SI AI pairs, right? And this is just supervised learning problem. That is, we have an input, we have desired output, standard supervised learning. So we are not gonna get into AlphaGo Zero today. Um, so we'll cover AlphaGo Zero, Alpha Zero, and Mu Zero on Wednesday. Any questions? I have a question for you guys. Maybe I can get a thumbs up, thumbs down. So rather than having office hours in the, like three hours office hours tomorrow, I was considering having maybe an, off, an hour of office hours tomorrow and Thursday and Friday. I was thinking that might be more useful for you for your programming assignment. I, I see one thumbs up, two thumbs ups, threes. Okay, so my thought is I will make them staggered times so maybe tomorrow morning, Thursday, midday, Friday, late afternoon. Any uh, feedback on that? All right, that's what I'll do. I'll put that on the schedule uh, as soon as I get done here. Okay. Otherwise, I will see you guys on Wednesday. I will continue to keep this Zoom chat open um, so for office hours for another hour. See you later.